that was even more intense than I had anticipated. <laughs> all right. How can you top all of these talks we've had? With Queen E.G. of Benin. And to tell us about her, we have our very own Casey Selden. Please, enlighten us. Hello, everybody. You guys ready for a master class in colonization? Because this, <laughs> too soon, it is, true. Uh, we've got a story that is best started at the beginning. So I'm going to tell you about a woman who was plucked from obscurity. She was a performer at a dance concert near the capital city of the Benin Kingdom. And she was apparently so beautiful and so graceful that she caught the eye of the Oba, which is the name of the king of Benin. And he said, I'm going to marry you. And that was kind of normal. Absolutely not extraordinary. Um, uh, in the time, the Oba could marry however many women he wanted, as long as he could keep them. Um, and you could choose anybody from any social stature. Uh, what was kind of extraordinary is that um, this woman was prepared for her new job as the wife of the Oba in a rather particular way. Uh, generally speaking, we're not entirely sure what year that is, this is, but it's probably somewhere in the late 1400s. We're not entirely sure how old this woman, Idia, is. She's probably past puberty, but just. Uh, her parents did not expect this of their daughter. <laughs> they were a relatively poor family, and they hadn't raised their daughter to be prepared for courtly ways. And so they decided that the best thing they could do to prepare her for this new chapter in her life that she didn't get to choose was to take her to a physician, cum sorcerer, who cut two slits into the center of her forehead, vertical cuts, and then they stuffed these magical herbs inside. And those magical herbs were meant to protect her and also to encourage her nascent magical powers. And that decision gave Idia her signature look which she carried for life. These angry 11s that you can see in every version of her face. And they may have been put there to ease her transition into palace life, but I'm sure that this external signal of her internal difference did not do her any favors. Because as soon as she got to the palace, that is all anybody could talk about. And you could not keep rumors at bay that anything strange that happened was Idia and her sorceress ways. She was there to stir things up, obviously. And this palace culture she was entering into, you can imagine it kind of like a combination of Game of Thrones and the darker parts of Harry Potter. Not everybody had magic, but if magic was a part of the story, then obviously it was a part of every story. And whenever anything went wrong, Idia's powers were to blame. For example, Idia gave birth to a son whose name was Esagi, and technically speaking, he should have been the third in line for the throne because he was the third son born to the Oba. Simple math. However, um, the Oba's second son and the Oba's third son were both born on the same exact day, and the Oba's third son, SG, Idia's boy, cried first. And so the king was told about the existence of this obviously healthy and crying son before the son that was technically born first. And so Esagi, Idia's boy, was second in line for the throne. And of course this was magic. <laughs> People were talking about whether Idia had bewitched the son not to cry or whether she had bewitched the like two dozen people while she was giving birth so that they wouldn't tell the Oba until later. Or maybe she just had made friends in the palace. Crazy, I know. Any way you cut it, it is pretty impressive that Idia managed this. And so now her son is second in line for the throne. And now that her son is second in line for the throne, everyone looks to Idia and her powers when the first son broke his leg in a mock battle with his brothers and was forced to abdicate to his um, more physically capable younger brother. So now Idia's son is first in line for the throne because of magic. And in 1504, Idia's son Esagi is crowned the Oba, the new king, when his father dies. 
And SG had this really unique upbringing for a Prince of Benin because his mother had decided to kind of change the paradigm of how you bring up a son. Instead of raising him Game of, Game of Thrones style to learn about combat strategies and battle from a very young age, she instead had him baptized in the Portuguese style because Europeans had started to show up on the Benin coast. And then she sent him to Portuguese school to learn how to speak the language. So later on, when the Portuguese and other Europeans start to arrive more regularly on the West African coast, SG is able to speak their language. He's able to evaluate any offers that they give him in a language he understands and set boundaries that they understand. And in this way, he uses communication as this incredible new tool that no other West African nation had thought of. So later, when this European merchant ship traffic starts to be really regular, thank you, uh, Benin comes to control the trade between the inland territories and the colonizers on the coast, and they make bank doing it on their own rules. So SG definitely has this, um, this very positive thing on his side, but not everybody sees it that way because, again, he was not raised in the same manner as his brothers. And so some of his more disloyal subjects, and in particular, the Oba's second son, who should, uh, by all rights at this point, be king, decide that SG is weak in the most crucial parts of kingmanship. So they declare war as does a neighboring empire who decides that they want to take over this land and they have this ruler who has no idea what war is like. And it's a fair argument. And with enemies bearing down on every side, suddenly SG at the very beginning of his rule is challenged to lead his nation in a way that he's not prepared for. So at this moment, it really comes in handy that he has such a singular mother because Idia knew that her son wasn't ready to wage warfare on this scale, but she loved him and she wanted what was best for him and she wanted what was best for her nation. And so she strapped on her own battle gear and led the Benin army herself. Yeah, this Idia, the same outsider magical sorceress who was totally not welcomed into the monarchy when she first showed up because it was clear that she was there to stir sh shit up. And it's true, even though she hadn't been trained in matters of battle or been brought up to lead an army, she'd figured out how to deal with the Portuguese and she'd navigated the game of Hogwarts style enmity of the palace. So. She could deal with this too. And <laughs> even though no one in this region had ever experienced a female monarch and they had never even seen a woman warrior, Idia, she had a plan for that. And it involved wearing just the right outfit. <laughs> you see, Idia knew precisely what others said about her and her sorcery skills. It had isolated her her entire life. And from that outsider perspective, as a bit of a misfit, she was able to see things that other people didn't. And it included the fact that this rumor mill that had colored her entire adult life was her greatest weapon. If she encouraged people to believe that she was absolutely skilled in magical powers, had made all those things happen, and her medicinal knowledge was going to be a benefit to the nation, she could convince them that she would be a formidable opponent, unseen in any battle in history, that um, would really aid in the leading of an army in this new era. If she could convince everybody that she was fucking terrifying, then they would follow her into battle. So she got dressed. On her forehead, she rested a charm with four cowries that ensured that any oncoming stone or missile would not blind her. On the back of her head, she added a charm known as a boomerang. She wrapped a precaution rope around her neck with four leopard teeth tied to it, and the rope reminded her to be careful and to avoid danger. <laughs> Basically, the message here was, y'all ready to follow me yet? No? All right, I'll keep going. <laughs> On her chest, she added a day belt designed to ensure that whatever the nature of her problems, dawn would always come. Hidden under it was a belt of dumbbells used to hypnotize her enemies while her belt of bells on the outside jingled to frighten the enemy to show that she was near. 
How about now? No? Don't worry. I have more. She next put on a hunger protector that prevented her from feeling hungry through the long days of battle. Underneath her loin cross, she placed the twin medicines. The first was, you don't embrace a young palm oil tree full of thorns. And that erected a psychic barrier to present enemies from daring her. And then the second was a traditional train never gets lost while being used for hawking. And that guaranteed her safe return. <laughs> How about now, bitches? Because I'm going to keep going. She propped all her medicinal items with the sacred belt of the night witches to accord her victory over enemies because she was aware that unless the forces of Nate ruled in your favor, you would never win. She hung daggers on sheaths on her two sides of her hips. She put amulets on her left arm and then carried on. She added poisonous arrows known as danger never meets the Awe bird while perched on a tree. On her right hand, she held a ward sword. On the left hand, she held a charm seized from an herbalist sent by the king of Ida to spy on her. These various packets were hung, sewed, hooked, and fastened to a ward rest made from the full skin of a mature leopard with the head, fore, and high legs completely intact to make her invincible to accident and defeat and also to scare everyone away. And I'm just going to leave this slide blank so that your imagination can run wild <laughs> about what she looked like heading into battle with this war dress on. Hmm? There are images, but they do not do justice to what a my imagination sets forth. But this will do for now. And her strategy worked. Esogy and Idia took to the battlefield and creamed all enemies that stood in their way. They beat them on both the physical and probably the psychological, if not the spiritual planes. And the truth is that we know more about the details of Idia's attire on the days that she took to the battlefield than we do about the details of the intricacies of her strategy. And to me, that part is amazing. And in another story, it would be extraordinarily frustrating <laughs> if the historians had focused more on a woman's garb than her actions. But the truth is that we have a written record of one outfit that one woman wore for one occasion in 1514. And in this case, knowing that outfit was a significant part of the battle strategy, I think it's incredible that her wisdom was cataloged. And having access to this wisdom, I decided I wanted to get on board and follow the example she set. So I Googled it. And it was terrible. Guys, Amazon does not come through on this one. <laughs> Though if you're in need of a medallion to help you find strength, we're selling some shit over at the merch table. Yeah. And I gotta say, this will do the trick. <laughs> Thanks. But in the general, uh, the past, the story of how you get dressed and what a war dress is in 1514 is far cooler than anything you can find in the present. And so I want to leave you with this idea. What if that wasn't the case? What if the present caught up with the past? What if we could gird ourselves with powerful medallions and precaution ropes and just the right outfit to help us out when the going got tough? Maybe more importantly, what if we didn't look at angry 11s as a sign of aging, but instead as symbols that were coming into our own wisdom? And what if we looked at outsiders with appreciation for the perspective and novel ideas they could offer instead of ostracizing all of those misfits and savants as outsiders? What if we wrote that future together? Now, in Benin, they were ready for this business, even though there was no history whatsoever for females to play any significant part in the monarchy and in decision making. Queen Idia was the first. She was honored as a powerful and politically astute woman who uh, was crucial to the success in the history of the empire of Benin. And provided crucial assistance to her son during those kingdoms' battles to expand. And upon successful conclusion of all these wars, Esagi, her son, paid tribute to Idia by bestowing upon her a brand new title, Ioba. 
And this is a title which is still used today and given to the woman who bears the Oba's first son, the future ruler of the kingdom. And this is a really important role in Benin. She's a major player in the nation's affairs and is routinely looked for, looked to for the wisdom and strength necessary to guide a nation. And despite this legacy, the histories about Idia tell us only so much. This was so long ago that there are lots of gaps in the story. And this particular interpretation of the facts laid down in the historical record is my own. There are lots of other explanations out there that don't give Idia so much agency in her story. But I really prefer this one, the one that um, paints her as really one of the smartest women ever who, without any real um, mentors to look for, figures out how to deal with brand new problems and to do it with such panache that against all odds, norms, culture, and taboos, went all out to achieve everything she ever dreamed of, even in death. She's been immortalized by this mask right here that hangs in the... British Museum, amongst other places, and in the hearts of many, including mine, and hopefully yours. Yeah. To the misfits. Thank you, Casey. So, <clears throat> we come to a close. Do you now envy the savant? Our role is to inform and entertain. You must be the judge. Personally, I feel an affinity for these words of Bertrand Russell, which seem to foreshadow the price paid often by extraordinary people with extraordinary brain powers. I've made an odd discovery. Every time I talk to a savant, I feel quite sure that happiness is no longer a possibility. Yet when I talk with my gardener, I'm convinced of the opposite. <laughs> Next, I want to thank all the speakers. Leonard, Casey, Rebecca, Arlo, Egan, Anetta. Oh, you're not getting off that easy. Uh, we also have one more big thank you for Kurt for uh, helming. This incredible ship and doing all the thankless tasks of wrangling all the cats and answering all the emails and setting all the deadlines and editing all the slides. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we have a special book for you about uh, Athanas, uh, Athanasius Kircher, the last man who knew everything, and your own Harvand. Thank you so much. I never try to get off easily. <clears throat> Coming up next, on December 11th, we have our final Odd Salon of the Year. And every year we end the year with oddments. <laughs> Meaning miscellaneous stuff that didn't fit into anything else. So please join us again on December 11th for our annual celebration. God damn it. Somebody look up the date on their phone. It's, it's the 11th. All right, it's the 11th. I didn't make that slide. <laughs> December 11th, for our annual celebration featuring strange stories, curious happenings, odd ends, unclassified wonders, and the official welcoming of new fellows of Odd Salon for 2018. <laughs> And our once annual holiday shop full of odd gifts for the curious oddling in your life and discounted events tickets for that salon is available now, are available now at the merch table. Now, if you are inspired by tonight's talks and want to join our stage, submit your brilliant ideas to us at oddsalon.com slash speak. And maybe you'll be here too. And you can join our email list to keep up with upcoming salons and speaker news. And of course, the usual stuff. Um, just search for Odd Salon in those various formats and you will find it. And if you like what you see here tonight, please consider joining us as a member 
as part of our Patreon community or as a sponsor of a salon. Members in Patreon both enjoy a host of insider benefits from ticket discounts to more odd stories from the odd salon speakers and fellows. Go online for more info or inquire at the merch table for details. You can join the ongoing conversation in our Facebook group, which is called Something Weird, where we'll be posting our follow-up reading lists and links related to tonight's talks, and where you can start your own discussions. And we welcome you to join us and share stories and inspirations with us there as well. So, in conclusion, thank you very much to Public Works for hosting us here. It's awesome. Thanks again to all six of our awesome speakers, our wonderful volunteers, and thank you all for coming. Good night. I didn't mess it up.